the Lord has risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, indeed. And it's a wonderful day to be in God's house with your Christian family. Families that share God's word, share the love for each other. We know each other because we are the family of God. And for that, we are all thankful. I want to welcome our guests today. I see lots of faces that I haven't seen for a while, and it makes me and the rest of your family so very happy to see you with us today. Let us begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we recognize that we are truly blessed, blessed as a people, blessed as a nation, blessed by the wonders of your creation, and especially this day that we celebrate the risen Lord and what it means to us and our faith and our relationship to you and to each other as God has blessed us as family and friend and church. We pray for your presence upon our life, for your guidance, for your forgiveness of our sins, for we recognize that we are a sinful people, but Jesus came so that we can be forgiven. We pray for your protection, and we lift up those people of the nations of this world who are at war, who have problems, who have suffering, that they may feel your presence in their life, that we as Christians may minister to them, that we may live by example, showing our love for Christ so that others may want to know him. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. I was surprised this morning when I first came back here, I was given a letter that came from the husband of the oldest member we had here in this church is written in longhand, so I may stumble through it because it's, it's a little difficult to read. It says, Beulah Remembers. And this was written by the husband of uh, Mrs. Webb, who was our oldest member. He says, my wife and lifetime friend, Grace Lipscomb Webb Gammon, was the oldest member of her church, Beulah Baptist, when she was taken to heaven by God. She passed on April the 2nd, 2022, peacefully holding my hand. Grace was born December 28th, 1922. She loved the church and as did all her family who were born on River Road near Beulah Baptist Church. She always talked to me about the pastors, Mr. Griss and Ed Shepard, who were always so kind and loving to her and her family. I lost the most wonderful wife and friend I hope ever to have known. I will be back with her in a few years. I think of all the times we've shared together and in a note she left me. She had a poem called, When Tomorrow Starts Without Me, I'll Always Be in Your Heart. This is so true loving always her husband, Carol. And he asked that I share this to you because we are his family also. And he wanted us to know how much he loved her and how much she appreciated and loved having a church family like ours. So remember the importance that we are all family, a family of God. At this time, Sandra, would you like to make a presentation about our concerns in the nation? What a happy day. And this is like the highlight, you know, Easter is, but we as Christians, every Sunday when we come to church, we, are we come to church to celebrate a risen Lord. And so I needed to say that to you all today. We have much to pray about. That's one of the privileges that we have as Christian believers in our living God. I want to read a passage of scripture to you this morning and it's found in James, the fifth chapter and the 16th verse. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
And this is just a wonderful scripture that points out that we need to pray for each other and we need to let each other know what our prayer needs are. Um, you know, the prayers of godly people have the power to accomplish so much. And I know a lot of our emphasis this year has been on the missionaries um, that are working in our country. And last week we talked about praying for the churches in the Bible Belt, all of our Southern Baptist churches. Today we're going to go back to um, a specific city and state. And we need to, um, our couple for this week that we need to be in prayer for are David and Teresa Martin. And they are church planners at um, Graceway Church in um, Indiana. And they're asking that we um, pray that they will be faithful leaders and followers of Christ and that they would find a permanent location for their church. Um, the big city of Indianapolis in Indiana uh, has a population in the uh, metro area of a, close to two million people. And of those two million people, 72.2% are lost, lost people. And so we need to pray for the churches in this city uh, of Indianapolis, and we need to pray for all the church planners in Indianapolis that they are Content, be, would be, will be able to continue with their work and that they will be able to plant churches that are greatly needed. Uh, there are other areas that I'm going to ask you all to be in prayer for too this week in addition to that. And I see in your bulletin, if you look in your bulletin, there's also um, in our Dover Association, Hardy Central Baptist Church on Darby Town Road in Richmond. Um, they're asking that we pray for the members of their church and their ministries and their pastor search committee. So please be in prayer for them. Our pastor search committee would like to thank you all for all the prayers that you all have been lifting for us. Um, a few weeks ago, I think I shared with you all that we had received a resume that we were going to be looking at. And um, today I want to let you know that we had, this person had, gave us a very strong statement of faith. And of all the resumes that we got, we have gotten so far, this statement of faith carried so much meaning with it. And we have decided to move ahead in getting to know this person better. I have had several contacts with him and they have been very positive. We are right now um, in the process of receiving um, word back from the references that he gave us. And we have also, um, will be meeting this week on Wednesday evening to go over the references. He has been sent a package of material about our church and about our county. And he, uh, the first time that I spoke with him on the phone, he already knew a lot about our church and our county. And so please, keep he and his wife in prayer, um, as I know that you all have been doing it. But I'm very happy to be able to share that information with you all this morning. Thank you. Oh, one more. <laughs> one more. I'm sorry. Um, I hope you all remember the Puller family, the Puller family that were here a couple of weeks ago the wife and two little children, and they have a Sunday afternoon young people's uh, gathering at their home, and they are teaching the word to young people in our county. And 
they are so plugged in to the needs of our county um, and outreach that the young people need and parents. So please keep this young couple in your prayers. They have a very Bible-based word that they're putting out to the young people. And pray also because they've outgrown their home. That's where they um, have their meetings on Sunday afternoon. They've outgrown their home and they're looking for a, a larger location where they can have their young people come. So be in prayer for the Puller family. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Sandra. I'm always reminded myself, we talk about prayer. If you want to be close to God, close to your faith, have faith be a regular part of your life, prayer is the answer. When you pray daily, talk to God daily, you get close to God. If you choose not to pray, there are too many other distractions in this world that takes you away from God. So just remember each day the value of prayer for you as well as those around you. At this time, we are very fortunate again to have Dr. Fort with us. He has been here a couple times already and we anxiously await to hear the word from Dr. Fort. Turn it over to you. We, we will have our opening hymn. The numbers in your bulletin, which I haven't looked at. 407. <laughs>
Dr. Gordon Ford. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we're grateful for your goodness and your grace to us. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as community, as church family, uh, to celebrate this incredible occasion that once in history, the worst thing that could have ever happened to the best man who ever lived, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, was actually the best thing that could have happened for the human race. And so today we celebrate not a savior whose grave has been sealed by a stone somewhere in the Middle East, but today we serve a risen savior uh, who is alive and well and moving and working even in this hour. And we thank you for the privilege we have of being your children through faith in him. And so today we ask you to bless each person who is here, the needs that each of us have brought into the room. We pray that your word would speak to us, the time of worship would bless us and encourage us, the special music would lift our hearts, and we're grateful, Lord, that we can worship you on this day, because we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have your hymn book, we'll be singing now hymn number 160, Low in the Grave He Lay. Why don't we stand together for that? I don't know about you, but I sing a lot better if I can breathe. So why don't you go ahead and stand up and let's sing together. Let's pray for our offering. Father, this morning we have the wonderful opportunity to give back to you a portion of the gifts that you've entrusted to us. We thank you that we can be stewards because every good and perfect gift comes from your throne of grace. So Father, we thank you that we can give to your kingdom's work and we pray that you would use these offerings for your kingdom's honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good. Hey, Miss Lynn, would you hand me that uh, phone to mine over there just so I can watch the time so we get out of here sometime today? I know that. Appreciate that. Thank you. I was going to go by that uh, clock up there, but I think we'd be here the rest of the week. So <laughs> I know you'd appreciate not having to do that. Well, listen, uh, I love that greeting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The New Testament church, when they would see each other after this day happened, it became a common greeting when they would get together. In fact, they didn't wait for Easter to say that because they were living in the aftermath of the resurrection. And when they would see each other, you know, when the Romans began to oppress them, they made the sign of the fish as one of the signals that they were a believer. And then they would many times, they would greet each other with that greeting, He is risen. And the other person say, He is? Thank you so much, choir. Uh, now this morning, I want to give a backdrop to something that we're going to talk about, the power of a covenant, the power of a covenant. And we're going to head from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Eventually we'll get there, so just stay with me. We'll get there. And we're going to the place where Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. He's having the Last Supper during Passover week before he'll face the crucifixion. And he institutes something that we as the church will celebrate together. In fact, the last time I was here, we celebrated the Lord's Supper together. And what I want us to see and understand from the Word of God is why this is such an incredible event in history. It's not just uh, about the fact that a man who was dead was raised from the dead and was seen by over 500 people, although that's a pretty significant thing. Not only that he had the power to lay down his life, but he had the power to pick his life up again. Now you have the power to lay your life down. You can give your life on behalf of any person in this room, but you don't have the power to pick it up again and live again as the Lord Jesus did. But there's something else that he instituted. When he had his last meal with his disciples, uh, he took a cup and he showed it to his disciples uh, maybe a common cup that they would pass around the group. And uh, he said, now this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so I want us to look at the Old Testament and then come to that event in the New Testament and talk about the implications for us and why we're celebrating Easter the way we do. Now, covenants in the Old Testament were not uncommon. In fact, uh, one of the first ones that you run into was God's covenant with Noah. You remember when Noah comes off the ark, God says to Noah, Noah, I will never do this again. I'm never going to destroy the world by flood ever again. I'm going to make a covenant with you and every living creature who was on that boat. Um, we're going to have an agreement. And so as long as the earth exists, this agreement is called an everlasting covenant, everlasting agreement. Then he said, now just so that you know I'm going to keep this agreement, I'll give you a sign. And every time you see it, you'll know it harkens back to this day when I made this agreement with you that I'll never do this again. Now what is that sign? The rainbow. rainbow, exactly right. So that was one of the early covenants that God made with his people and with his creation. He said, I'll never again do this. And the sign of that covenant will be the rainbow. Now, fast forward to Abraham, something called the Abrahamic covenant, an agreement that God made with Abraham. Abraham was out in the wilderness, camping out. God says, step out and look at the heavens. Leanne and I, uh, about two weeks ago, were in Utah. And uh, I'd never seen the national parks. I've all, I grew up in Africa. Y'all who have been here since I was speaking before know, I grew up with missionary parents in Africa, middle of five boys. And uh, so I didn't grow up in America. So I've never seen any of our national parks except one, the Grand Canyon. We're on our way to Ridgecrest, uh, uh, I mean, Glorieta, New Mexico, on our way to Glorieta, New Mexico. And mama and dad took us out to the Grand Canyon and you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but basically it's flat and you get out of your car and you come, I was like, where is it? 
And you come walking up to this edge and you look down and here is this incredible canyon that had been cut out by the river. Well, we were out in Utah and so we were, uh, Leanne found an itinerary where we could hit five parks in eight days. And uh, I mean, we were moving quickly, but we were having a wonderful time. But one of the things we have missed about Africa, where we lived and worked in the desert as missionaries, is the night sky and the brilliant stars and the Milky Way and the Southern Cross. And out there in Utah, we had a couple of dark nights and we stepped outside and got to see that incredible starry sky. That's what Abraham saw. God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Uh, you see those stars? Your descendants are going to be like those stars. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. And from you will come the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, he looks up at the skies and God commits this covenant to Abraham. And Abraham was given a new name. At that time his name was Abram and his wife's name Sarai. And after that God said, now because of this covenant, here's the sign, you're going to get new names. You and your wife will now be Abraham and Sarah. And this covenant is going to be passed down through your lineage. And later uh, God's going to commit this to Jacob and Isaac. He'll, they'll both hear God say now. You remember that agreement I made with your dad, your grandfather? It's, it's good for you too. It's going to carry on as an everlasting covenant. It's never going to end. Because out of your lineage, someone's coming who's going to bless all nations one day. And uh, God made this covenant with Abraham. And the sign of that covenant was a sign of circumcision. Every eight-day-old little boy born into a family would be circumcised on the eighth day. That was the sign of this covenant. Now fast forward to Moses, the Mosaic Covenant. You know about this covenant. It's one of the most common that we read in the Old Testament. Moses, uh, being called out of Egypt, takes the people out into the wilderness, comes to Mount Sinai. Sometimes it's called the Sinaitic Covenant or agreement. God calls Moses up into a mountain. There he meets with him and he says, Moses, I have a way that I want my people to live. There's a way they ought to behave. There's, a, there's certain things that I require of them if they're to be my people. This is how I created you. And he gave the law. Uh, most commonly in the Ten Commandments, but if you read Leviticus, there was a whole lot of other stuff that God spoke to Moses up on that mountain. And while God is speaking to Moses on the mountain, he receives the covenant. He goes down to give it to the people. And all the people agree, yes, yes, we want God to be our God. Because God said, if you want me to be your God, this is what you have to do. This is a conditional covenant. I will do this if you will do that. And all the people are like, yeah, great, we'll do that. And then what happened? Moses goes back up the mountain. And he's gone too long for their liking. So they come to Aaron, who was left in charge. And they say, Aaron, we don't know what's happened to him, so we, we just want to have a, our own idols to worship. So we want to have a big idol celebration. And Aaron, later when Moses confronts him, makes one of the most amazing excuses you've ever heard in your life. He, he gathers the gold earrings and the gold bracelets from all of the people, and he says, I just threw it in the fire, and their calf appeared. <laughs> I've heard some like that myself once in a while. <laughs> uh, they made their excuses, and God said to Moses, okay, look. He saw from the mountaintop what was happening down in the valley. Friends, so often we think that God, <laughs> God is somewhere far removed, and we can do whatever we want to, and he, he, he doesn't know what's going on. Listen, the night is like noonday to him. There's nothing hidden from his sight. Uh, nothing in your life is hidden from the searchlight of God's spirit. He knows everything that's going on with you. He knows everything that's happening in your life. There's nothing hidden from his sight. And God says to Moses, I'm done with these people. I'm starting over with you and your family. And we'll just uh, make an agreement with you and your kin folks. Now, I don't know about you, but I've thought about that many times. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, if I'd been on the mountain and God had said that to Gordon Fort, 
I'd headed down the mountain. I'd got my wife, Leanne, and my kids. I said, listen, we're out of here. See y'all later. <laughs> y'all are on your own. <laughs> but you know what? Moses didn't do that. Moses stood in the gap between God and his people. There was a breach that required God to take action. And Moses made an appeal. We talked about this, I think, in the first message I preached was the importance of prayer. And God turned away his wrath at Moses' request. And the covenant, the agreement, the covenant stayed in effect. Moses went down the mountain and uh, he told the people what God had told him. And Moses killed a bull and sprinkled the people, it's called a hyssop, it's a little branch that will, they can use to spread the blood around because you see this covenant was sealed by blood. This covenant was sealed by blood, and the sign of this covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was the Sabbath day. God said, you will keep the Sabbath day, and that Sabbath day keeping is a sign of this covenant. Now, that was the Mosaic covenant. Now, I want you to come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're going to look at one that's been put into effect here. 1 Samuel, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 18. We're going to look at a, at a different kind of a covenant here. This is a covenant between Jonathan and David. And you'll see the significance of this when we get to the New Testament, okay? The sign of Jonathan and David. Now it came about, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him, David, that day and did not let him return to his father's house. And then Jonathan, here it is, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. All right, now what is this about? Now think about this just for a minute here. Jonathan is a son of King Saul. David is the youngest son, and he's a shepherd boy. But there's something about his character that is attractive to Jonathan. Jonathan sees something in David that draws him to this young man. Well, you know what David did to, uh, to Goliath. I mean, that would kind of get my attention, just that fact. But Jonathan, in the Old Testament, I feel like he always gets the raw end of the deal. We hear about David, how great he was. And in fact, when he was uh, over the king's men, uh, they started singing songs. The women would sing songs when the men would come from battle and they'd say, uh, Saul slays his thousands, but David slays his ten thousands and made Saul jealous. This, so David was an attractive character. And, and in the shadow of David, I think Jonathan gets a raw end of the deal. You don't hear a lot about Jonathan, but let me just, let me just tell you something about Jonathan, the king's son. There's a time that the Israelites have gone into battle with the Philistines. And the Philistines have occupied the high, uh, the high country. And the Israelites are in the low country, and they cannot advance to conquer the Philistines. And so they're at a stalemate. And Jonathan gets his armor bearer, and he says to his armor bearer, Listen, God can save with the few just as he can with the lot. So he says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And he gets his armor bearer and he says, we're going to go show ourselves to the Philistines on top of that mountain. And I'm going to say to him, hey, let's have a fight. And if they come down to us, then we'll know, okay, no, no, we're not supposed to do it. But if they say to us, hey, you two men, you want to fight? Come on up here on the high ground where we are, and we'll just get it on. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. If you, if you know anything about military tactics, which one of those, if it's your choice, where are you going to stay? High ground or low ground? 
Oh, you're staying on the high ground every time. You see what Jonathan did? He asked the prayer in such a way, there was no way he's going to lose. Those Philistines are not coming down to fight him. The place they're going to fight him is up in their territory. And so sure enough, now think about this poor armor bearer. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, we had a dog in Botswana named Seppi, and, uh, and we had a, another boxer dog named Sandy. And Sandy was a great snake dog. I mean, she would take on, one time I came home from the bush and uh, had walked into the house. It was nighttime, left something in my car, and I was going back to the pickup truck, and Sandy ran between me and a Mozambique spitting cobra and, and took the, the spit of that cobra, which is poisonous, in her eyes and protected me. I mean, that is a courageous dog. I had to take her and wash her eyes out. She was fine, but uh, that, 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 that poison of the Mozambique spitting cobra is highly irritating. And so Sandy jumps in between me and this snake. Now, if she would find one out in the yard, Seppi would bark, but she would stay far away from the snake. <laughs> And she would be barking like, come on, Sandy, come get it. Come get it. I mean, have you ever seen anyone like that? Oh, if there's danger or the hard work, they're like, yeah, you go, boy, you go. And where are they? They're sitting back drinking sweet tea in the shade. Okay? Well, this armor bearer, I just think about this armor bearer. He's like, Jonathan, you want to go fight the whole army by yourself? You just have at it. But leave me out of this deal. But this armor bearer, See, this tells me something about Jonathan. This armor bearer says to Jonathan, whatever's in your heart, I'll be right behind you. You trust him. You trust his courage. He's not just being bravado. He's not just kind of doing something stupid here. This is a man who's casting himself on the mercy of God. He said, I'm burning my bridges. If God doesn't come through, I'm done. And old Jonathan climbs up and says he actually has to hand off his armor so that his hands are free to climb up to where the Philistines are. And Jonathan climbs up, his armor bearer follows him, and within a short period of time, he's killed 20 men. And it creates quite a ruckus amongst the Philistines that this one guy is attacking and taking on their whole army. And the Israelite spies down below, they see that something's happening up on that mountain. And King Saul's like, what is going on? What's going on? And they look around and say, uh, your son's missing. And Saul says, if he's up there by himself and he's attacking these Philistines, we can't leave him up there. So the rest of the army goes up on top of the mountain. By then, Jonathan has killed 100 Philistine warriors. Now, does that sound like someone that's just a namby-pamby uh, nobody? I mean, this guy, that's why I say, I feel like Jonathan many times gets the short end of the stick. And we really don't see much about him in the Old Testament because of the role David plays. But now this Jonathan is the one who sees something in David's character and says, I want to make a covenant with you. And he takes off his royal robe that would cover his shoulders, and he puts it on David, takes off his armor, gives it to David, takes his sword, his shield, and his bow, and gives his weapons to David. Now, here's something important to note here. What did David give Jonathan in exchange? Nothing. I mean, can you see? Can you see? Can you see, David? Uh, Jonathan, would you like my slingshot? <laughs> I mean, he's got nothing, right? You want my little shepherd's tunic? Got a few holes in it, smell like sheep, but I'd be happy for you to... No, he has nothing to give to Jonathan. But when Jonathan gives him his royal robe, he's saying in this covenant, he's saying, David, I'm going to share my position with you. I'm a king's son. I give you this royal robe. I take you like one of the king's sons. He hands him his weapons. What's he saying to him? David, I'm promising you my protection. Whatever I can do, if you're in trouble, I'll protect you in whatever way I can. And later on, when Saul is chasing him, Jonathan keeps this promise. I'll give you my possessions. 
I'll give you my protection and I'll share my position as the king's son with you. Now, unfortunately for Jonathan, he has a bad dad. A lot of sons have suffered because of dads who didn't walk with God. Wounded because their fathers were harsh, critical, uh, never blessed them, never took them under their wing, never showed them how to be a man. One of the sad things in our culture today is young boys grow up and don't know how to be men. Jonathan, unfortunately, he's going to suffer as a result of his dad's decisions. Don't ever think, parents, that your kids won't pay a consequence for actions you take. Oh, they do. Sometimes it's tough. But if you've been one of those who unfortunately grew up in a family where you weren't loved and you were wounded and hurt, don't ever think that it means you, there's no hope for you. Oh, no. Uh, God, God has a plan for your life, and he can heal those wounds, and he can restore you, and you can be the first one in your family generation to start a new direction for your family. I've seen this happen many times in my life, where one person will take a stand and follow Christ and change the whole history and direction of their kin folks. Well, Jonathan, unfortunately, is going to suffer. Now Saul has been chasing David. He's jealous of him. He feels like one day David's going to take his throne from him. And so Saul becomes jealous. And there's a whole story here about Saul chasing him all over the place. And Jonathan trying to protect him. And David finally ends up in a foreign land in a place called Ziklag. Where he's hiding out with 400 men who've come to find him because of his leadership. And uh, the Philistines come again to fight against Israel. But this time the Philistines have the upper hand. They break through the ranks of the Israelites. And they find where Saul is. And they chase Saul and his sons. And on that day Saul and his three sons are slain. And the word gets back from Jezreel. The armies of Israel have been defeated. And the people scatter and run everywhere. And then because of what David's been doing and the way the people have seen his success in military uh, uh, battles, they call over to send David to come back and help them. And so now David comes back into Israel and over a period of time, he conquers their enemies. He's conquering this tribe and that tribe. And finally the tribes are being restored. And then we come to this day when finally there's, there's peace in Israel. And David has now taken the throne. And now here's what happens. Listen to this. First, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. David said. <laughs> he's on his throne in the throne room looking around. His stewards are there. The servants are there. The warriors are there. And he says, uh, is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And everyone in that room pretty much are going, all right, this is the day we've been waiting for. We knew this was coming. Because what did a new king do immediately when he takes his throne? What would he do? He'd kill off all the offspring of the previous king. Why? So that they would never rebel against him and restore the kingship to the bloodline of the previous king. So everyone is waiting for this day. One day, David, he's going to bring up this topic, but it's because he wants to wipe them all out so that he'll never have any opposition. There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. And the king says, Is there yet any one of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, Well, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. The king says, um, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. 
Now that's like saying he's living in Timbuktu. That's what, that, that, that's what, that's what he's saying there. He's in that Lodabar actually means nowhere, no place, backside of nowhere. And his name is Mephibosheth. Now Mephibosheth, how did he get lame? When the word came from Jezreel that Saul and his sons had been killed, one of the nursemaids in the palace grabbed up Jonathan's five-year-old son, you'll find it in 2 Samuel 4, and goes running out, terrified, to flee. And she, something happens to where she trips and drops this young boy, and his damages on his legs cause him to be crippled. And she takes him out to the backside of nowhere to hide him out so no one will find him. But uh, King David has a lot of resources at hand. And the day comes when word comes to Timbuktu, Mephibosheth, David's calling for you. Now can you imagine, this little guy has been raised to be terrified. If there's ever a new king in Israel and he finds you, you're done for, bud. You got no hope. And here comes that day. Takes him up to meet with King David. Now listen, to, get this picture in your mind. So then King David, verse 5, sends and brings him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, look at this, fell on his face, prostrated himself. He walks in to the throne room and he just throws himself face down before the king. David said, um, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth laying down there, you've got to be quivering, shaking. Here's your servant. And David says to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you'll eat at my table regularly. And again, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant? that you should regard a dead dog like me. And then the king called Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I've given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants will cultivate the land for him, and you uh, shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. But nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Wow! What happened? I mean, you go from being a dead dog, crippled nobody, living in Lodabar, and suddenly this king is saying, I'm going to share with you my table, and I'm going to restore to you all of your grandfather's lands, and I'm going to sign to you a man who's going to oversee your household and all of his servants to take care of you. But Mephibosheth, you never have to eat by yourself anymore. You're going to come eat at my table with my sons, with my family. Now I want you to see this. What did David just do? You remember the covenant? He shared what? His position with him. His royal palace. He shared his possessions with him. He said, I'm restoring all of the lands to you, and I'm going to assign servants to you. You're going to take care of all your fields. And he says, you never have to be afraid again because you're like one of my sons. The whole army of Israel is available to protect you. You see what David just did? He just gave Jonathan his slingshot. Oh, he didn't have anything back in the day when that agreement was made. But you see what he did when that time came that he had the opportunity to give back in that covenant that Jonathan had made with him? And now Mephibosheth is laying there thinking to himself, Oh, I must be a really great guy. That's why he's done this. Oh, I must, I must be someone really smart. That's why this king is doing this. What do you think he thought? <laughs> he said, I... I feel like I'm a dead dog. You know why that happened to him? For Jonathan's sake. 
It had nothing to do with Mephibosheth. All right, now, let's fast forward to the New Testament, okay? All right, now remember, Jesus is in the upper room. And, uh, and Jesus is with his disciples, and he says to them, you see this cup? This is the new covenant in my blood. And he said, this new covenant is a new agreement between me and my father. Hebrews said, this is going to be a better covenant. It's in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus at the upper room is making a new covenant with his followers. Now, this is why this is so critical. All right. Now, one day you wake up and someone says to you, all of heaven's resources are available to you. Because why? Because you're an heir of Jesus Christ. So everything he has belongs to you because you're his heir. Not only that, but Galatians says, uh, I mean, Ephesians 6 says, put on the whole armor of God. I mean, suddenly someone is telling me that there's a spiritual armor that I can wear that will protect me from all of the darts and assaults of the spiritual enemy, Satan and his demonic force. So I'm an heir, all the possessions available to me. And Jesus said to me, up until this point, you haven't asked anything in my name. Ask and I'll give it to you. And he's sharing his possessions with us. He shares his position with us because he says, you're not now just a servant. No, no, I don't, I don't call you servant. I call you friend. A friend of the Most High God. And why did we get this? You think we're going to go to heaven one day and say, God, you're so lucky to have me you on your team. Must have been because I was so good looking. I was so smart. I'm so intelligent. I got so much education. Uh, you know, that's why God gave me all. Oh, no. You, you want to know why? Look, look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And, and just, just read these words with me. And think about this. Jesus is giving us a new covenant, a new agreement. Signed and sealed in his blood. And every time we as the church gather and take the Lord's Supper, whenever we hold up that cup and eat that bread, it's the sign of this new covenant. Sealed in his blood. Why does God offer me the resources of heaven? Why does God offer me a spiritual armor? Why does God welcome me as one of his children, as his royal son and royal daughter? Listen to Ephesians 4 verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, and that was something my mama said a thousand times to me as a boy growing up with my brothers. My younger brother Greg and I fought every day. Mama knew something was wrong with me if we didn't have a fight. And my mama would say, same team boys, same team. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. She'd usually leave the tender hearted part off, that was hopeless. But she would say, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. But look at the rest of this verse. Even as God, what? For Christ's sake has forgiven you. Can you imagine this? Joseph of Arimathea, who's the guy who gave Jesus his body, his new grave. Cut out from the stone. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent man in Israel, one of the religious scholars, he has him a fancy new grave waiting for him one day, a new tomb waiting for him, cut out of stone. Uh, this, this, this is not the common place to bury it. And someone comes to him and says, uh, Joseph, I've hear, I hear you up. Uh, you gave your tomb up. You gave up your new tomb for, for this guy that was a criminal hanging on a cross. And Joseph of Arimathea said, well, uh, he just needed it for the weekend. And Jesus splits the throne room of heaven. And here comes this thief along with him. And one of the angels at the, at the door is like, uh, excuse me, sir, what is your occupation? Thief. Well, I think you've come to the wrong place. <laughs> uh, what are you doing here? And Jesus looks over and says, hey, don't worry, he's with me. 
because there's a new covenant now to be kept. Can you imagine? Friends, today we have a new covenant that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. The old covenant was one you had to keep yourself. When you transgressed, you'd have to go down to the priest and say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, this is going to cost you a couple of turtle doves. Oh, no, that one right there, I'm sorry, bring a goat. Some of y'all take about a dozen cows. And you'd have to sacrifice those to pay the penalty for your transgression. What about today? Oh, you see, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Friends, Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sin. Nothing for you to do about it. You can't pay for it. You never could pay for it. Jesus paid for it. And today, he is offering us a new agreement. And you don't have to do anything to keep that agreement. He keeps that agreement with his father. It says he's the mediator of this covenant. It's all on him to keep this agreement with his father. And do you know what this covenant is called in Hebrews? An everlasting covenant. Until he comes again, Jesus is going to keep this covenant. And today, if you're not a follower of Christ, he invites you to receive the gift of salvation and enter into this covenant with his Father. You don't have to. You want to live lost and try to do good deeds and pay God off for your sin and work like a slave and never be satisfied that it ever was enough? You can. Or you can simply do what Mephibosheth did. Don't you know when he got out of that throne room that day, he enjoyed the benefit of that covenant, eating at the king's table. How about you? Today we celebrate Easter. That's why this is such a big deal today. That's why this is such a big deal in history. Because when this new covenant was put into place, it changed everything for us as the human race. Oh, no longer do we bear the burden ourselves, Jesus. I bore my burden on the cross and opened the windows of heaven to anyone who would want to receive the gift of salvation, repent of their sin, and turn from themselves and turn to him in faith and receive the gift of salvation and be born into his kingdom to live, not as a slave, no, but to live as a child of the king, a one who now wears the royal robe as a son of the living God. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you today for a new covenant. And we thank you that our Lord rose from the dead, sealing and signing this covenant as an everlasting covenant. He shed his own blood to seal this covenant. And he rose again on the third day, just as he promised. And every one of us today can have freedom from our sin, our brokenness, our hopelessness. Doesn't matter where we've come from, doesn't matter what our background is, there's hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, today, any person in the room who's never entered into this new covenant with you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just reveal this truth to their hearts and they would open their mind and heart to believe and trust in Jesus Christ and receive this gift of everlasting life. And from this day forward to walk with him in newness of life in a new covenant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing. Let me find it here. Let's stand together. Oh, I love this. 426, Victory in Jesus. 426, Victory in Jesus. What a great song to sing as we uh, have a benediction for our service. Let's stand, Victory in Jesus, 426.
this is true. If I die and I go to heaven, which I plan on, and the Lord says to me, Gordon Ford, why should I forgive you for your sins? What's my answer going to be? Because I'm so smart. <laughs> oh, we had to tell you otherwise. Oh, no. Oh, because, uh, you know, I just worked so hard for you. Oh, no. Because we spent 20 years in Africa as missionaries, Lord, that means you ought to let us in. Oh, no. What will my answer be? For Jesus' sake. Because I love you. I want to be on your team. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, I tell you, the only reason I'm forgiven is for Jesus' sake. God looks at his son, Jesus. He says, you died on the cross for this rascal. Um, your mama's friends never thought they'd amount to anything. But Jesus, he received you as his personal Lord and Savior. I'm taking your debt. It's on his account. So Gordon, you can come in. But it's for his sake, not for yours. Now, friends, that's the only hope we have today. That's why this is such a big deal on Easter. Don't forget it. Every time you take the Lord's Supper, you take that cup, you're being reminded there's a new covenant. There's a new agreement that Jesus has made with his Father, and we get the benefit of this new agreement that Jesus is offering to us today. Oh, I hope you have a great afternoon. I hope this is a wonderful Easter day. I've gotten tired of washing my truck every day from the Paulette. So I've been in one of the kids on that deal. Let me know. All right? But let's have a prayer of dismissal, and then we'll be on our way. Thank you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, today, oh, how good it is to be a child of the Most High God. Thank you for this new covenant. May we as church family just rejoice today in the remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection to seal and sign this new agreement with you, to show us that it's acceptable to you as Heavenly Father. Bless everyone in this room today. Thank you for those who've come and taken the time to be a part of this service today on Easter. And may your hand of blessing just rest on each person in the room, wherever they go. May your hand of blessing rest on them. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.